I'm the only one who's looking ahead here. Welcome, friends. Uh, it is a distinct pleasure to introduce Sarah Bleich as the speaker today. Um, we are very lucky to have her, not only because it required uh, bringing her from her important work in uh, Washington, but also because it requires keeping her from the World Cup, uh, which, which, which uh, has everybody's attention. Um, Dr. Bleich is the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity at the Food and Nutrition Service at the US Department of Agriculture, after serving as the senior advisor for COVID-19 in the office of the secretary at USDA. Um, there, she's one of the key point people for all of the discussion about nutrition security that's, that's uh, been happening in the last couple of years. She's a policy expert and researcher who specializes in diet-related diseases, food insecurity, and racial inequality with more than 175 peer-reviewed publications. Over the years, in particular, um, people in my classes have been following her work on sugar-sweetened beverages and on childhood obesity and um, related topics sort of at the intersection between nutrition and public policy. She's on leave from her post as a professor of public health policy at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, the Kennedy School of Government, and the Radcliffe Institute. And Dr. Bleich earlier was a White House fellow during the Obama administration, where she worked in connection with the Let's Move, um, the Let's Move campaign. Um, she's going to be talking today about the most recent White House conference, which has served as kind of a central event in collecting um, contribution from civil society to think about all of these important nutrition issues of the day. But I first met Sarah in a different White House conference that she had organized during the Obama administration, also on um, nutrition assistance policy. So this is clearly something that she's been devoted to for a very long time. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Bleich. Thank you so much. I actually didn't realize that we met at that conference. Oh, that's so funny. Wow. Yeah, that was a conference during the Obama administration focused on um, SNAP. And we and Park was brought in for his expertise. Wow, that's so interesting. Well, it's great to be here. Big thanks um, to Dean Mozafarin for inviting me to come and speak with you all. This is, I think, the second time that I've been here in the last year, and the and the last time that I was actually thinking about White House conference issues was when you guys hosted the 50th anniversary event, um, which was here in the School of Public Health, and then. Now we are on the tail end of the second historic White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. So a huge amount has happened in the past three years, much of which this school should be very proud of for driving and pushing really important change. So what I wanna do in the next 20 minutes or so is talk about what USDA is doing around nutrition security and also talk about what's happening with respect to the White House Conference. So with respect to the conference, do you want to first say that I was one of the USDA points of contact. So I spent a huge amount of time working on this conference in the summer and um, early on in the fall. And we'll say that was I was really blown away by all the enthusiasm for folks participating in the listening sessions that happened all around the country, attending conference planning sessions, sharing ideas through the website, and making significant contributions to helping us achieve the conference goals, which are to end hunger and reduce diet-related diseases and disparities by 2030. Um, certainly one of the best parts was the opportunity to connect with folks about all the work that we're doing and the excitement. I hadn't been in the same room with many of the folks in years um, when I saw them all in Washington. And it's really only been the last several months that I've been out in the world and had a chance to interact with people. So it's just nice to be able to connect with people in real life and not always do it through a computer screen. So I'm especially pleased to be here in person with you all today. Another memorable part of the day for me was also the opportunity to connect with folks that have lived experience. There were um, several dozen individuals 
who were invited to come attend. Many of them sat on the panel sessions. Many of them came and just listened and provided their feedback during the breakout sessions. But these are folks that have current lived experience with various aspects of the social safety net. And one of the reasons that the opportunity to speak with these individuals was so important to me personally is because I also have lived experience. So if we go to the next slide, what you'll see is a picture of me and my siblings. So I grew up in inner city Baltimore. And this is a picture of me on the left. It's my brother in the middle and it's my twin sister on the right. This was taken at Memorial Stadium, which is where the Oreos used to play. It's about a mile and a half from the house where my parents still live. And my parents were public school teachers. My mom stepped out of the workforce for a period to take care of me, my twin sister, and my older brother. And so for a period, our family received SNAP, we received WIC, we received um, school meals. And that was obviously when SNAP used to be called food stamps. So every time that I go home to Baltimore, which is pretty frequent because, you know, my parents are still in a house. It's not very far from this picture. I'm just reminded of how important the work is at USDA to make sure that families are fed and that they are fed well. And one thing that's really important to understand about USDA is 70% of our budget, we have a pretty large budget, at least 70% on average, and it's actually higher right now because of um, congressional authorities due to COVID, is spent on trying to provide Americans with healthy food. So it's a core part of what we do. And then every time I go to work, I just feel like what a privilege it is to have been a recipient of these programs and then to have an opportunity to sit on the other side and think about how do you take this strong suite of programs and make them even stronger to impact people in their real lives. So Oh yeah, thanks. There we go. Thanks. Um so have I'm, I'm Dari's going to raise his hand. I know that for a fact. But how many of you have heard me talk about nutrition security? Okay, good. Well, that's good. Um, so one thing that we are being very deliberate about in this, this whole year is that we're trying to beat the drums about when USDA says nutrition security, what do we mean and what are the key equities that we bring to bear? I have given over 100 presentations easily, and I am always surprised about how many folks have not heard this messaging. And the reason we're spending so much time on messaging is that we want to set USDA up for a long future track record to not just be focused on food insecurity, but to be focused on the dual challenges of food and nutrition security, which is why we're going around and spending a lot of time talking about the work that we do in this space. So to be more concrete, you know, we have a suite of programs at USDA and there are 15 of them, and they together serve as the federal nutrition assistance programs. They serve one in four Americans over the course of a year. And what they aim to do is to provide children and income eligible individuals with access to safe, nutritious, and equitable food, along with nutrition education and promotion resources. Now, these nutrition assistance programs obviously have broad reach because they are touching one in four Americans over the course of a year. And just to give a few examples of the marquee programs, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, touches 41 million Americans each month. School meals touch 30 million children each day. And WIC serves nearly one in two infants in the United States. And this is at almost 100,000 schools and a quarter of a million retailers that are authorized to accept SNAP benefits. So in addition to our nutrition assistance programs, we also spend about a billion dollars across all of our programs in nutrition education. And we also at USDA translate the dietary guidelines into my plate, which essentially is the consumer translation to make it easier for folks and, and easier for consumers to make choices at various points um, during the day. We also have a broad investment in research and food systems. So I do want to highlight that the key motivations for our nutrition security work at USDA, but before I do, I just want to say a word about the definition. One thing that's happened over the past year is that our messaging around nutrition security has evolved. So this is not a static thing. We are listening to feedback, we are hearing where the pain points are, and we are trying to make sure that we are crafting language that resonates and that's sticky. So we, when we talk about nutrition security at USDA, what we mean is consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, and affordable food that is essential to good health and well-being. And that is motivated by two key things. One is that we are really prioritizing equity. 
The second is that we recognize at USDA that structural inequities make it very hard for lots of people to be physically active or to follow a healthy diet. And so one of the things that we've really tried to be concrete and clear about over the past year is that we recognize that structural racism is very real. Now, we don't think at USDA that we're going to solve this problem on our own, nor do we think that the whole of federal government is going to solve this problem on its own. But we have tried to be thinking carefully about how do we take our programs and our policies, applying a racial equity lens, which is important to the president, it's important to the Secretary of Agriculture, and weave that throughout everything that we're doing as a way of doing our small part to chip away at the problem of structural racism, which is not just real, but it harms health in ways that can be described in ways that can be measured, and ways that can be dismantled. So this is an area that we're continuing to push on and welcome thoughts that you have about other ways that we might go about doing this. Now, if you want to learn more about the nutrition security work that we're doing, there is a report which we released almost a year ago, so it was last March, which really lays out our actions on nutrition security. It provides the pillars which serve as the scaffolding for all of this work. And so those pillars are first meaningful support, so providing nutrition support from pregnancy to birth and beyond, healthy food, which is connecting all Americans with healthy, safe, and affordable food, collaborative action, which is developing, translating, and enacting nutrition science through partnership, and then prioritizing equity every step of the way. I want to take a few minutes and just walk you through an example of each one of these pillars to be more concrete about what we're trying to do. So the first pillar, meaningful support, has four subcomponents under it. All of these pillars have subpieces. For this one, what I want to focus on is ensuring benefits are adequate to support healthy eating patterns. What we did um, is that in October of 2021, we evaluated or we reevaluated what's called the Thrifty Food Plan. How many of you are familiar with this? Okay, some of you. So this essentially serves as the basis for this, the size of the SNAP benefit. The reevaluation this time around was critical because it was not cost neutral, which allowed the overall size of the SNAP benefit to increase permanently. And that was by 21% or $36 per person per month. This was a game changer. It was the first permanent increase to the Thrifty Food Plan in more than 45 years. Now, fast forward to October of 2022, another thing that happens to SNAP on an annual basis is that the size of the package is updated to reflect food inflation. And so, as you all know, when you go to the grocery store, food prices have gone up. And so then in October of 2022, the overall size of the SNAP monthly amount went up by an average of 12.5%. That is one of the largest inflationary increases in the history of the program. And what that means practically is that for a family of four that is at the lowest income level, their monthly payment is $939. And that is up from $835 last month. So what this is doing is it is putting healthy food within reach for individuals and families who participate in the SNAP program. Now, the next pillar is healthy food. As you can see, it's got three buckets that are associated with it. The, I want to focus on that middle one, which is using incentive programs to promote healthy access to, to promote access to healthy eating. And want to really think about the GUSNIP program. So I'm guessing many of you are familiar with it. But GUSNIP stands for the Gus Schumacher Nutrition Incentive Program. It is essentially trying to get individuals to purchase and consume more fruits and vegetables. And so the what this map is showing you is these are the nutrition incentive projects, the produce prescription projects. So in purple are the nutrition incentive projects, in green are the produce prescription, and in that, um, I don't even know what color that is, lime green, um, are the states that have both. So basically two different vehicles where you can do incentive programs through GUSNIP. And if we go to the next slide, the takeaways here are that there was an evaluation that was done in the second year of this program. And what it found is that in that time, participants redeemed about $20 million in benefits, which is significant. They increased their fruit and vegetable consumption, which is exactly what the program is intended to do. And importantly, there were improvements to food security. So based on this robust result, the popularity of the program in June, when the secretary announced the food system transformation framework, which is a whole host of actions across the food system to really transform it, to make it more sustainable and durable, 
One of those actions was an additional $40 million for the GUSNIP program. Now, if we go to the next action, which is collaborative action, or the next pillar, which is collaborative action, want to focus in on the top left one, which is updating and building the evidence base for dietary guidance. So one area of collaborative action I'm guessing that all of you know well is how we at USDA partner every five years with the Department of Health and Human Services on the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. We are coming up on the next edition of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, which will be the 2025-2030 cycle. There are many faculty here at Tufts who have participated in these Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee, which is a really important role in nutrition policy. And what you can look out for is that in early 2023, that committee for the 2025 report will be announced. And the reason the dietary guidelines are so important is that they really serve as the cornerstone for federal nutrition policy. So one of the things that we'll talk about is we just announced the update to the WIC food package to align it with the dietary guidelines. Coming on the horizon is an update to the school meal standards to better align it with the dietary guidelines. These guidelines are very important to how we think about nutrition policy in this country. Another area of collaborative action that I want to highlight is around SNAP education. So we, over the past year, have made a number of important and critical changes to SNAP education. So this is a program within SNAP. It has an annual budget of about $450 million per year. It's in every state. It's in a number of territories. And it is um, the money is pushed out through the implementing agencies, of which there are over 100, and those implementing agencies work with tens of thousands of community partners, about 34,000, to push out messages and information through SNAP education. So it's a program that's got tentacles all around the country, and it's small but mighty. Um, so we did create an, a one-pager on SNAP at effectiveness that just encourage you all to have a look at, but if we just go back to that prior slide just for a second, want to emphasize some of the key changes that have happened in SNAP. So one of them is that for the first time in the history of the Food Nutrition Service, there is now a branch that is dedicated to SNAP education that is led by a PhD in public health nutrition, and it is staffed by public health nutritionists. The perspective and experience of that group is going to be really important for providing critical national leadership around SNAP education. So for those of you who are doing work around SNAP Ed, encourage you to reach out to that office, make sure they're aware of the work that you're doing and understand if there are possible areas of synergy. Another important thing to be aware of is that there are very concrete efforts now to improve data collection across states and make it comparable. So there's a new system called NPAIRS. The PAIRS part stands for Program Evaluation and Reporting System. The N is national. And essentially, that's going to make it possible to have indicators on the effectiveness of SNAP-Ed across the country and over time. Another important thing that we did with the guidance that came out in the spring, it comes out annually to SNAP-Ed implementing agencies and the states is that we really pushed as we think about nutrition security for those who are implementing SNAP Ed to take maximum opportunities to use policy systems and environmental change strategies. We know from a lot of the research that's been done in public health nutrition that the PSC approaches are one of the most effective ways to drive toward behavior change. Now that doesn't mean that SNAP Ed will stop direct education, which has done for a long time. But it does mean that from a policy position, we are trying to push the program more in the direction of how do we use those dollars to be able to reach more people through things like policy systems and environmental change strategies. And if we go to the next slide, what you can see here is a one pager that we created about SNAP ed effectiveness. And the reason we did this is that we were hearing from the field, SNAP ed doesn't work, largely from the Hill. And we thought, well, it's small but it's mighty. And actually there's a fair amount of information that says it's doing a lot of good things. And so we put that together in a one pager and we've been pushing it out just to really help go against that narrative that the program doesn't work. This is a good example of how we tried to listen hard, hear where some of the pain points were, and then create information to try to go against it. If you know of areas where you think it'd be helpful for us to put together materials that can help make messaging more effective, please tell us because we would love to hear it and love to make changes. Um, so the next pillar is equitable systems. This has uh, five components listed under, as you can see. The example that I wanna focus on is around tribal, tri tribal efforts in that top left bullet. And if we go to the next slide, what you can see is that 
One of the areas that we spend a lot of time on is tribal food sovereignty. So this initiative started off at the beginning of the administration. Pictured here is Secretary Vilsack on the left, who's the secretary at USDA, and then Heather Don Thompson on the right, who is the director of the Office of Tribal Relations, which importantly, that office now sits within the secretary's office. Previously, it had been taken out. So it's, it's an important signal of how important tribal relations are to this administration. Just last week, there was an announcement about additional resources and efforts to really push toward tribal sovereignty. So for example, there was a toolkit that was put out for ranchers that wanna make the switch from cattle to bison. Bison's a very important protein for many tribal populations and a host of other things um, that were pushed out. And there's a summit, I think it's next week at the White House around um, tribal relations. So this is an area where there's a lot of work, not just in the food space, but the food piece of this, particularly around tribal sovereignty is very front and center at USDA. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more, I've just given you like the tippy tippy tip of the iceberg. If you want to learn more about the nutrition security work that we're doing at USDA, really encourage you to go to our webpage. So we have a landing page, USDA Nutrition Security. It's easy to find. From there, you can link to a webpage for each of the four pillars. On those pillar pages, you can find literally a census at this point of everything that's happening across USDA within those subpillars that we went through quickly and then divide it up by different age groups. So what are we doing with kids? What are we doing with the elderly and so on? And we update that pretty frequently. And it's not just activities at the Food Nutrition Service. It is all of USDA. So I encourage you to leverage that resource. Okay, so that was nutrition security work. Let's switch gears now and talk about the national strategy. And so this was released the day before the White House Conference on Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. This includes input from more than 20 federal agencies who all had a hand in driving the policy actions that were put forward to push towards the goals of the White House Conference, which again are to end hunger and reduce diet-related diseases and disparities by 2030. So as you can see listed in the middle of the slide, the national strategy is anchored by five pillars. I won't take the time to read them off to you, but we'll take the time to give you a couple of examples of what USDA is doing in each. So if we go to the first pillar, which is improving food access and affordability, this pillar is aiming to make it easier for everyone to access and afford food. And the president is committed to pushing Congress to take several steps that don't just address food access, but address economic well being. So, things like extending the expanded child tax credit. And the main rationale for this is that what we don't want is for people to have to make the very hard decision about do I pay my rent or do I buy food? Do I pay for my medicine or do I buy food? These are impossible but real choices that people are having to make. And so, as we think about how do we improve food access and affordability, it is not just about physical and financial access. It's also about broader income supports, and that is reflected in the national strategy. Now, for us, for USDA, we have dozens of actions in the national strategy. I think more than 40. I think we might have the most of all departments, but I could be wrong about that. Our number one priority falls under this pillar, and it is healthy school meals for all. And the main reason is that we want to reorient the school meal programs from not being an ancillary part of the school day, but to being a central part of how children learn. So it's like how we treat books and desks and laptops. We want school food to be considered in that same vein. We are seeing efforts around the country to do this at the state level. So Massachusetts has universal free meals. California has universal free meals, as do a couple of other states. This is an area where there is there's pressure being put on Congress, but also there's a lot of room for state activity to do a lot in this space and would say that it's going to be important as these efforts are stood up to think about, you know, what are some of the essential components? So things like expanding access to local and regional food systems. What we obviously saw in COVID is that when supply chains shut down, it is hard to get to get food from point A to point B. We all remember going in the grocery store and not being able to find bread or milk, for example. It's important to enable more schools to cook meals from scratch, which requires in some cases, kitchen equipment or technical assistance. It's gonna be important to invest in the nutrition workforce so that there is the expertise to actually push forward with the meals that are gonna help make kids healthy and then expanding nutrition education for children. What will hopefully happen is that the first major step toward this goal is working with Congress to expand healthy meals for all kids by 9 million children by 2032. So it's an area to keep an eye on and to stay tuned for.
Now for the second pillar, which is integrating nutrition and health, this aims to really prioritize the role of nutrition and food security in overall health so that the health system is not just treating disease, but it is also preventing disease. There's a lot in the national strategy related to this area. Some of it is in the food as medicine space. A lot of work is being done here at Tufts to drive the empirical evidence about why food as medicine makes common sense, why food as medicine makes dollars and cents sense. Um, so thanks for all the work that's happening here. Um, but would also say that another important thing from our perspective at USDA that the national strategy does is it calls for more screenings on food insecurity. It calls for that to be universal in the federal government, and it calls for it to be dialed up with private payers. And a bit later, I'll talk about why it's so important to create that bridge and warm handoff to our programs because they are not currently fully maximized. Now, to directly advance this pillar, we hosted a summit at USDA, which Dean Mozafarian was able to attend, where we tried to bring together the healthcare sector with um, folks on the food side to talk about the intersections with nutrition security. So um, we were able to, the, the day started off with remarks from Secretary Vilsack. It ended with remarks from Secretary Becerra at HHS to be very clear that this effort is intended to, I'm gonna use the bridge word again, to really form this very clear bridge between equities at USDA and equities at HHS. Because when you put those two together, there's a lot of power to try to drive toward what we're trying to do with the White House Conference goals. So the goals of the day for that meeting were to really celebrate and showcase all the things that we already know are happening in the healthcare space, to, and then to identify, you know, where are there opportunities to raise up awareness about the USDA equities? For example, most pediatricians know about WIC. Many general doctors are not aware of SNAP and WIC and eligibility for school meals. And so just spreading that knowledge and making it clear where all these different opportunities sit that are not fully maximized is really important. And it makes sense for healthcare to lean in because it's gonna benefit their patient population. So what's coming next is that we hosted that meeting in October at USDA and then ProMedica, which is a Midwest healthcare chain, they're going to be hosting a series of meetings in 2023 at each of the, the FNS regions. So the Food Nutrition Service has seven regions around the country. There will be a meeting at each one of those that continues the discussion about how do you bridge the healthcare sector with nutrition security? What are some of the concrete things that you can do? What are some of the lessons learned that we can take away from those health systems that are already leaning in? And particularly, what are the implementation, implementations, tactics, and strategies that are really going to make the difference? So we're looking for leaders to talk to other leaders in the space, and we'll sort of take a backseat and serve um, as facilitators and just really raising awareness about the equities that we can bring to the conversation. Now, also on pillar two, another piece of that is strengthening and diversifying the WIC workforce. This is important, and it has been a call from stakeholders for a long time because there is a desire for the WIC workforce to look like WIC participants. That is not currently the case. And so there is work that's happening to better integrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility principles into the WIC workforce, as well as an assessment of pay and pay equity for those who work in the WIC space. Now, for Pillar 3, there's a whole lot that focuses on making it easier for consumers to access or have access to healthy choices. There's a ton of stuff that we're doing in this space. I'll just highlight two, which are we just published a proposed rule around the WIC food package that came out week before Thanksgiving. And we're also going to be publishing a proposed rule on updating the school meal standards. You might recall that last January, we had the bridge rule that was put in place that is meant to bring us out of pandemic operations. The next step is to make that final with this, um, with school meal standards that will hopefully be in place by the 24, 2025 school year. So the next step in that process is the proposed rule on school meal standards that is expected in 2023. The fourth pillar is supporting physical activity for all, which makes it aims to make it easier for everyone to be physically active. At USDA, we are working to enhance online physical activity education through SNAP-Ed, um, which again is a program that has very broad reach around the country. And then the last pillar, which is most relevant to many of you in the room, is around research. And so what the national strategy re recognizes and what the administration lifts up is that if we want to really make a dent in these problems and drive policy, we have to have sound science. 
And so what the national strategy says is that it is committed to bolstering nutrition research funding and to ensuring that we have sufficient resources to effectively conduct consistent and innovative nutrition research. This is an area, though, where commitments are going to be important. So you might have seen that the day of the White House conference, eight and a half billion dollars of commitments were announced, non-federal commitments in support of the White House conference goals. Commitments are still being collected, and more philanthropy around research is going to be an important way to push for the opportunity to do all the research that's going to be necessary to tell the story of the actions in the national strategy. So one thing that we did to really try to take advantage of the momentum around the White House conference is that the day after, we released a report at the Food Nutrition Service which focuses on how we are leveraging the pillars of the White House Conference to promote our nutrition security work. So this is freely available online. And what it really tries to do is talk about, it's a bit of an introduction to the Food Nutrition Service for those who don't know. So it's who we are, who we serve. It gives a very nice shout out to the work of the FNS staff, particularly during COVID. And I'll say one more sentence about that in a second. Um, but it also talks about a lot of the exciting work that we have underway. And it's just wave tops because we don't have the space in the report to talk about everything. But just to make a point about the FNS staff. So at USDA on the food nutrition policy side, we typically deal with two major legislative vehicles, the farm bill and child nutrition reauthorization. Those two take up massive amounts of time. In two years during COVID, we helped shepherd through successfully six pieces of legislation, neither of which is the Farm Bill or Child Nutrition Reauthorization. And so that just tells you how hard people are working. These are things like, you know, the Family First Act, um, the Infant Formula Bill that recently came out. These are intended to create solutions to help people in crisis and during the pandemic. And this was done by staff who, like many of us, have small kids at home, have elderly folks that they're caring for, are they personally are impacted by the pandemic. And so I say all that to say, often career staff are in the shadows. From my experience, they are a tremendous group of people that deserve all of our praise because of both how hard they work and how much they know and care about these programs. So there are lots of folks from Tufts who um, are now on career staff at the Food Nutrition Service. I work with some very closely around the White House Conference. And so this is a bit of a plug for you all to think about federal service if you think it might be something that would fit within your career path. And I'm happy to talk more about that. But if we go to the next slide, um, these are just a sprinkling of some of the actions that are included in that report that we just talked about that came out the day after the White House Conference. So I've already talked about modernizing WIC. Um, I've already talked about the workforce, but encourage you to have a look at the report to just get a sense of some of the things that we're up to and then go to those nutrition security pages to find out more. I did mention that we did a big update to WIC food packages, and those are really important. It's the second time in the history of WIC that we have made an update to the WIC food packages, so it really is quite significant. A lot of work has gone into the rollout and will continue to go in. This is the proposed rule. We have to get to the final rule stage. Um, and so just a couple of things that I want to highlight here, if we go to the next slide, which is one is that, you know, WIC serves 6 million infants and moms and young children over the course of the year. It is one of our most powerful public health programs. Unlike the entire rest of the suite of nutrition assistance programs, WIC by statute is required to address health outcomes. That is a really important piece of this program. And part of what we are trying to do with a $390 million from the American Rescue Plan Act, which is to modernize and innovate around WIC, is to try to rebrand WIC as a public health program and really try to drive participation because it is not nearly where it should be. In fact, it's only about one in two who are eligible for WIC that participate. And as a former WIC baby, I know how important this program is but there are more barriers to entry than if you're, say, participating in SNAP, and it's a prescription program. So you can buy certain types of milk and certain types of bread and certain types of dairy, and it varies depending on which of the food packages you have, whereas SNAP is a little more flexible in the marketplace. That said, it is still a very strong public health program. So to the extent to which you all have opportunities to encourage folks to engage in the WIC program, would really urge you to try to do that. So... One thing, so now I want to switch gears if we go to the next slide and um, and talk about different ways that you all can lean in and some of the ways that I think that 
that this community and researchers in general can be helpful. Um, so the first, and this is circling back to this point around utilization, is it is very much the case, and if we go to the next slide, you'll see this, that the programs are not fully utilized. So this is illustrating what we know about WIC, where it's about one and two are participating. You can see there was a high watermark around 2010 that has dropped off since. These numbers are currently in the process of being recalculated, so we will have new estimates relatively soon. But the bottom line is that a little less than 50% of folks who are eligible for this program are not participating. And we are really trying to do everything in our power to change that. But we need help with that last mile. Community groups can play an enormous role. Faith-based groups can play an enormous role, and they are. But we're all going to have to, this is an area where it's going to be important for everyone to lean in in concert to really try to make a difference. Another thing we know about program utilization is that when it comes to SNAP, it's about one in five who are eligible that are not participating. Now, most of those folks have small benefit amounts because the vast majority of SNAP dollars in the marketplace are redeemed. But still, these are dollars left on the table. We are still in the public health emergency in many states. And so the emergency allotments are continuing, which means the average SNAP benefit is larger than it is in non-pandemic times. So it's important for folks to take advantage of that while they're able to, if they're eligible for that service. We also know about that one in five, that a big chunk of them are elderly. And so we are working with the Social Security Administration to try to facilitate enrollment in SNAP for the elderly and disabled, but it's an area where we need more help. And then the final is summer feeding. So we've got about 30 million kids in the school meals during, um, during the fall or during the school year. And that drops off um, to a much smaller percentage during the summer. But kids are obviously still hungry in the summer. So we're gonna, we need help in trying to close that summer feeding gap. Just as one example, if we go to the next slide of another ask that I have of all of you, is just to keep an eye on information that's coming out of USDA. We produce a lot of materials. So like with every campaign that we push out, we're producing infographics like this. And we just did a whole series of them when the WIC food package went out. One of the reasons I'm highlighting this one is that one really critical change that happened over the summer, that the special authority that USDA had from Congress, bless you, to provide healthy school meals for all kids, that went away. What that meant is that we were returning to the pre-pandemic operations. So if you're a parent and you have a child in public school or in school, you have to then submit a free and reduced price meal application. This was not clear to a lot of parents, and if it's not clear to the parents, their kids are not getting signed up. So we had a whole campaign about how important it is to sign your kids up, and it's not just because your kids are getting fed. It's also because these applications are tied to Title I funding for schools. And so this is an example of if you see materials coming out of USDA, just help push the word out. You all have deep connections in various communities, and it's really helpful when trusted members are the ambassadors of this information. And then um, the final thing that I would say is to, and this is most relevant to all of you, and if we go to the next slide, which is really encourage you to keep us posted on the work that you're doing. My first time around in government, one of the things that surprised me most was how permeable government is to the outside, meaning that you can reach out and say, I want to come and present to you on this really amazing study that we just did, which is relevant to a whole bunch of your programs. And you'll get a whole team of folks that want to hear what you're doing and then stay connected. Or I just want you to know about something that just got funded and we expect results in about 18 months, but I just want to have this on your radar. Reach out, make sure that your folks are aware of your work. You could do it yourself. You could do it through your professors, but it's really important that the work not get lost in the academic journals, but that particularly for the policy relevant work, that it have the opportunity to bubble up because it can help drive the policy process. You know, for the first year of the administration, I had a COVID hat on. I did COVID all day, every day. It was shocking how government would shift with new research studies. I've never seen anything like it. So science matters and it drives policy, but it has to be in front of folks who are in decision-making positions in order for it to get the bullhorn that it needs. So I'll just end by saying, I think it's really exciting what USDA is trying to do with respect to pushing forward both food and nutrition security. This school and all of you play such an important role in building up the evidence base and helping to drive the recent White House conference. So just keep doing what you're doing. Consider careers in federal service. I'm a total spokesperson for it. Um, and I'll just stop there. I really appreciate your time. Any questions from you all? Or I don't know how it works online. Yeah. No, we'll let you we'll let you
Yes, ma'am. Oh. No, no. I see So I just had a question regarding SNAP. Uh, so you mentioned there are some, there are going to be some new changes. But I was just wondering in the aspect of different cultures and like, for example, I come from a Chinese background and I know in my previous job, when we went to educate the different um, areas, we went into the Chinese community to educate them about the, like the different resources, especially with SNAP and whatnot. But for them, it was like, we don't really have any resources for the Chinese community. So even if they get the funds from SNAP, there is nowhere they can use the SNAP. So I was just wondering, like, moving forward, is there a different, um, I guess, aspects of looking at different cultures to help in that sort of way? Like, even if there's funds, if they don't have anywhere to go to use it, then I feel like that's a dead end. Yeah, it's an excellent point. So I would say... Big picture, across the whole suite of nutrition assistance programs, there is a very strong interest in quote-unquote cultural competence. Do we have the right language translations? Do we have an appropriate focus on kosher and halal as just one example? So there's a lot of work that's being done to think carefully about these different pieces. One example is in the WIC food package. We've done specific listening sessions around the issue of kosher and halal. Can expect probably a very similar thing to happen when we do the school meal standards um, coming up. These, you know, these changes take time because sometimes it requires changes in statute, sometimes it requires changes in regs, sometimes it could be administrative actions, it just depends. Um, but I think that my message to you is that while the federal government can sometimes move slowly, there's a lot of active thinking about the exact question that you're raising, because if we can't reach people with the foods that are meaningful to them, we're not doing our job. So that's a great question. Was there? Yeah, in the back. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So why are we not talking about food businesses? Because I that was something that I found missing from the White House conference as well, is food businesses are, they play a major role in the food choices consumers have. And on top of that, what about fiscal policies that provide subsidies for producing more fruits and vegetables so that they're more readily available at an affordable price for the consumers. So can you maybe speak a little bit about how food businesses come into play into this whole environment? Yep. Okay. So I, I heard food businesses and I heard agriculture. Massive questions. They're great questions. So on the point about food businesses. So a couple of things there. The national strategy by design focused almost entirely on federal actions to drive policy. Included in each of the pillars were calls to action about you know, what could happen in a non-federal space to drive policies forward. So one of the things within the, um, the national strategy that gets pointed out is, for example, the stocking standards for SNAP authorized stores is hung up in Congress right now. So it calls on Congress to do something about that. That's one example. That sort of shift would affect about a quarter of a million stores. So it could be significant if it moves out of Congress. But more broadly, the question is like, how do we help create a healthier food retail space that is driving us towards both healthier choices and healthier consumption? From our perspective at USDA, one of the most significant tools that we have in our toolbox is the SNAP Retailer Incentive Waiver. That is something that came out of the 18 Farm Bill. The regs were put in place in 2020. And it essentially, what it does is there is an equal treatment clause. By statute, you have to treat SNAP customers the same as every other customer. What this waiver allows stores to do that are SNAP authorized is it allows them to treat SNAP customers differently and incentivize the purchase of foods consistent with the dietary guidelines for Americans. So fruits and vegetables, low-fat dairy, whole grains. Included in the commitments for the White House Conference is a Midwest chain called Meyer. They have about 499 brick and mortar stores. They have implemented this incentive on fruit and vegetables, which can take many different forms. You spend $10, you get $10 back. You get 50% um, off. There's lots of different ways it can be implemented, but they're doing it. 
Then in October, Baltimore City and Amazon announced a partnership where if you've got a Maryland EBT card, and if you go shop on Amazon Fresh for six months, starting, I think it was in November, you get $30 of free fruit and vegetables that are not pulling out of your standard benefit. Those are just a few examples of, of existing tools that retailers can use to lean in. But that's on the federal side. On the non-federal side, there's so much room to think about how do we think about online marketing and what is the role of retailers in doing things differently? How do we think about brick and mortar marketing and what could retailers do to try to push us toward healthier options as opposed to pushing us towards unhealthy options? And I think that is a space that the federal government has yet to have a lot of success in, which to me makes it ripe for commitments. And I hope, you know, again, commitments are still coming forward. So I hope there might be opportunities for large companies to come forward and think about how can they make a difference in this space? And I will say there are a lot of companies that are thinking about this. So there's one very large chain that is trying to bring about 100,000 SKUs into their grocery store. They're a super center and do it at the same price point as the unhealthy SKUs, but have these SKUs be sort of the dietary guidelines um, for Americans version of those SKUs. So SKU is like the um, when you go to buy packaged goods, that's what I'm referring to. So it's basically a replacement item. So I think there's a lot of innovation that's happening but there's so much more that could happen in this space and so much that needs to happen outside of federal government. To your last point about ag, you know, that was just not a central feature of the conference of the connection between say farm subsidies and what we eat. It was just too big of a topic, I think, to try to pack in all under that one umbrella. What I can say generally is that USDA obviously has both sides of the house. We've got the food side and we've got the ag side. And, and, and very important in terms of the priorities that the secretary has laid out is there are only five for this administration. Three of them are tackling food nutrition security, addressing climate smart agriculture and forestry, or adjusting climate change through climate smart um, agriculture and forestry, and then driving local and regional food systems. So those three things together begin to do the food system transformation that you're alluding to. Um, but obviously it's it's much bigger than that. And there's a whole lot that needs to happen. So it's a great question um, and it would require a much larger comprehensive response, but I hope that helps a bit. Yes, ma'am. I wanted to ask uh, about SNAP Ed. Um, so I actually recently for my written exam wrote a proposal on SNAP Ed, Ooh. which I hadn't known much about previously. And one of the criticisms of SNAP Ed is in fact, the long-term effects of it aren't really clear. So maybe directly after an intervention, there'll be increases in fruit and vegetable intake or maybe diet quality. But over time, say over a year, we really don't know how um, it's changing dietary intake. So um, I wasn't uh, quite aware of pears or um, so would you talk more about sort of efforts to look at the long-term effects of the program and because um, SNAP uh, benefits have increased are our efforts transitioning to say budgeting of transitioning away from budgeting in SNAP to maybe making um, cooking uh, or uh, tools in the kitchen, more talking, having a better conversation about that with SNAP uh, benef excuse me, um, beneficiaries. And then my second question is- I need a you, pen. Yep. Uh, <laughs> Wait, I got a marker. Okay. okay. My second question actually is about sort of connecting with the people that we want to reach. Um, I think you're speaking to the sort of the chronic issue of not being able to reach communities. And I know here at Friedman, we are trying to uh, increase a social media. So out of the many things that you said we should push for, what is one thing that you would say to the social media folks here and communication folks here? What's one thing that you would say, focus on this one idea and maybe expand it out to make it very clear for consumers? Who's the audience? The audience would be, uh, say, SNAP participants, low income, low income okay. Americans. Okay, great. Okay, so that, wow. Those are like four or five great questions. So with, let me start from the top. So with respect to SNAP Ed, 
and looking at persistent effects of SNAP education over time. My honest answer is I'm not aware of what research is underway. It's a great question. The, there is a general problem across research of understanding persistent effects. You know, we often look at, you know, what is the effect of X intervention or X trial, but we don't always look at it out over time. In some cases we do, there's like a strong history in WIC and SNAP and some programs, um, but not necessarily, at least I'm not aware of it. Do you know, Dari? No, okay. Um, so I don't know, but what I can say is there are evaluations underway looking at the impact of the thrifty food plan reevaluation. So that's the increase in the size of the SNAP budget on purchasing decisions. And that's gonna research that will happen within USDA. I have no doubt it will happen from many folks outside of the USDA, likely including this school. And it's gonna be really important for understanding impacts. The second part of your question around SNAP ed was budgeting. So one important thing to remember is that SNAP is by design supplemental. So even if a family of four who gets the maximum benefit is receiving $939 per month, that is not expected to necessarily complete their whole budget because the program is supplemental. The increase that happened with the thrifty is new money because it is money that didn't exist and it is a permanent increase, which is why it's so significant. But the increase that happened this October is based on inflation. So basically it just means you can still buy that bread you used to buy, even though the price has gone up. So what that means then in practice is that the, the budgetary pieces of SNAP education still remain essential to helping people think through, like how do I afford healthy foods in a cost conscious way? This is reinforced by a lot of the messaging coming out of the Center for Nutrition Promotion and Policy, CMPP, through my plate. So it's something that we try to do in surround sound, but these are not very large budgets. So it's hard to put a lot of effort into that area. But suffice it to say, SNAP-Ed is an active area where we're still trying to really help folks be cost conscious about the choices that we're making. Um, the second part that I heard was, if I could leave you with, and I love these questions, if I could leave you with one message about connecting with people, I'm gonna tell you two, if I may, which is if you were talking to researchers or folks in the policy space, the message is USDA is focused on food and nutrition security. They are both vitally important and we are not getting rid of our long standing efforts on food security. If I could talk to the average low-income American, I would probably say, did you know that there are all these food assistance programs out there? Are you taking advantage of what's available to you? And I think the key here is tying it to Medicaid. So one thing that's happened in COVID is that there is continuous enrollment in Medicaid. That is gonna stop when the public health emergency ends at a date uncertain at this point. And so once that continuous enrollment stops for Medicaid, that's also going to pull people off of SNAP because some people come to SNAP through Medicaid. Yeah. So it's really important to look at the social safety net holistically and figure out where are the areas where most people are falling out and how do we get them back in? And then once they're in, connect them with all the different pieces that, you're con that they're eligible for. But I think the key is, did you know, and here's where you need to go to get more information to find out because it is not enough to push stuff at people. There needs to be some sort of warm handoff or bridge. I had a uh, online question and I'm gonna just paraphrase, um, but it was asking about the access part, which I know you mentioned in the first pillar, but the question asked about food apartheid and areas of limited uh, food access and uh, how is that being incorporated? That's a great question. Um, so a couple of thoughts on that question. Um, one is that one of the biggest shifts in my mind that is helping with food access in low-income populations that are eligible for the nutrition assistance programs is the shift to SNAP online. So the way life was in March of 2020 is that individuals in five states had the ability to use their SNAP benefits online. It was a pilot program that was slowly rolling out. The pandemic happens and we all know how this story goes. And now it's very hard to get access to food at stores. There are concerns about social distancing. There was a rapid expansion to make sure that folks could use their benefits online to the point where it's now 49 states in DC and about 97% of SNAP participants have the ability to use their benefits online. Now this is not perfect, 
There are a lot of pain points in the process, but it is really critical for making it easier for folks to access food. Now, online doesn't change the problem of some people just like to go to the brick and mortar stores. Some elderly folks, like my mother, would <laughs> she, my dad ordered food for them online because they're older at, um, during the pandemic. And she just couldn't believe you could actually do that. And if she were on her own, she never would have done it. So there's a whole group of people for whom online is a non-issue. And so what do you do about them? And the, the food banks have actually been a really critical piece of this. The food banks tied to food delivery. I saw a really cool example of this in Cleveland where I think it was Lyft had partnered with the food bank. They would come and pick up boxes for the CSFP program, and they would deliver those out to elderly individuals. That's just one example of how access was trying to be improved. But then if we think about the charitable system, another thing that we have to consider is that donations are way down. And so then food banks are having to purchase a lot of that food, which makes it hard for them. And then demand has gone up. So it makes it hard for them. But food banks are certainly an important part of the puzzle. And then thinking about, you know, how do you stand up stores in areas and do it in a way that they can be sustainable? So there's obviously the great example here in Boston of Daily Table, which is essentially a non-for-profit that really wants to end hunger that is that I think is disguised as a supermarket sort of in how their business model works. They're doing a lot of work in Chicago to try to bring stores to the, to the west side, which is a really poor part of the city, by helping. I think one of the things they're looking at is there's like a $25,000 entrance fee. I think the city is looking for ways to potentially waive that. Um, but I think the bottom line answer to this question, which is a good one, is there are federal actions that can help with access, but there's a whole lot of creative community actions that can help because the ability to get food where you are is a hyper-local issue. And so you need hyper-local solutions in many cases. And so I just, for those of you that work in the access space, just encourage you to engage with communities, figure out what's working, what's not working, and then drive towards solutions that will make a difference. So th thank you for that great presentation. Thank you for two years of uh, incredible service uh, in your in your role and all the work you've done. Um, two, two questions. So one thing that wasn't in our task force report and wasn't in the national strategy, and now I'm you know kicking myself, and I wonder if it could be incorporated into the USDA's top priority around universal school meals is the time students have to eat lunch. This is something that in my own experience with my three kids in public school and is, is, a, is a flashpoint. You talk to parents, you talk to kids, they all say the same thing. I don't have enough time to eat. And, and there's lots of research showing not only kids don't have enough time, they don't finish their food, they, they selectively don't finish healthier foods because they take more time to eat. And that makes their diets less healthy and it, and it increases food waste and, and is financially a problem. From my reading, and I've you know just been educating myself on this recently, the, the, the federal government recommends 30 minutes of school school lunchtime. I don't know any kids anywhere that have thirty minutes. All all the kids in my school have twenty minutes or less, uh, and so and so that I think that could that be one really important pillar to make that thirty minutes have some teeth in that recommendation and tie federal reimbursement to having thirty minutes. And of course, you know, administrators complain about this or that or school lunch space or other courses, but. I love what you said about wanting to make school lunch part of school. And so I think that's one area that just probably if we had all thought about it would have been in the national strategy and could it now be be sort of entered. And then my um, my second question is around the universal um, screening for food security in the electronic health record throughout the federal government and then actions to make sure that happens in the private sector. Um, given that there is now a GUSNIP NTAE nutrition security set of questions, and given also Tufts with others has developed nutrition security questions, can we start to incorporate universal screening for food and nutrition security? Those are great questions. Okay, so on the first one, so the time that kids have to eat falls in the authority of education. But this is something that we have talked about internally, and one of the things that the national strategy is basically encouraging federal departments to do is to cross pollinate and to figure out how do we create policies that drive toward change. So I will take that back and see if we can set up some time with Ed to talk about what's possible. I think it's a great, it's a great thought. It's one that we're definitely doing, we're talking about internally. Um, on screenings. So I my sense is that 
on the federal side, there's things that will happen on the federal side. Like one, we have to get to everyone getting screened for food insecurity. But what you're saying is, but we have some measures that are being developed around nutrition security. Can't we integrate those? My guess, and I could be wrong, is that that's going to happen faster on the private sector side and that those results are going to help drive what happens federally. I think it is definitely a challenge that we are talking a lot about nutrition security and we don't have a single agreed upon metric because naturally what people say is, okay, well then how do you measure progress? It's a totally fair question. My response to that would be, we have good measures of diet quality already, like the healthy eating index and some others. So that's one that we can track over time. A second is that we can't wait for the metrics to catch up because we have real problems right now around diet-related diseases and disparities, but we have to work fast, which is why it's great that you all are doing the work around developing a metric. GusNIP is doing the same. At ERS, which is the Economic Research Service at USDA, there's conceptual work that has happened over the past year, which is really designed to think about how do you, how do you move from food insecurity conceptually to nutrition security? What are the intervening variables that are needed? And then the next step is to test that empirically. But this takes time. Like doing the trials that you all are doing around nutrition security measures take time. And so I would say that probably what makes the most sense is to have like big health systems like Kaiser, I bet they'd be willing if they have, I don't think they've integrated it yet, um, to integrate like a nutrition security screening wide, broadly. And then see how that tracks with food insecurity and what we can learn from it that would drive other health systems to do the same. And I think, I guess, and I'm sort of rambling at this point, is that it may be much like food as medicine, where it's this snowball effect, where it starts small and then there's increasing interest. And now food as medicine feels like many, many big health systems are getting comfortable with it. And I think the hope is that nutrition security does the same. But I think to do that, we've got to convince people that the measure is not going to change tomorrow. And I think that's hard to do because it might change tomorrow. We'll stop it there. Um, but uh, let's give a, a, a great thank you uh, to Sarah for this wonderful interview. Thank you. Ha, 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 ha.